So um, uh, we have now the uh, third and last lecture by uh, Joshua Weitz. Uh, before he starts, just to remind you uh, uh, an etiquette on how to uh, ask questions. If you have a question, please uh, post it in the chat uh, or use the raise hand uh, feature on uh, of Zoom. I'll uh, post in the chat the, the instructions to use that feature once again. So uh, please, Joshua, if you want to share the screen, uh, you can start the presentation. Thank you very much for being okay. here. Perfect. Thank you, Jacobo. Can you hear me? Is the sound yes. loud enough? It's perfect. Good. Let me then share. And hopefully you can still see me, see my slides and hear me. Yes, I do. Great. Okay, well, welcome back, uh, folks, to this third lecture. I'm trying to make each connected, but also stand alone in case people pop up and just see this one. So this will be the third lecture on virus microdynamics, spanning principles, ecology, and therapeutics. And because therapeutics was the last in that sequence after the uh, Oxford comma, I will be focusing on therapeutics today. And just to, again, remind folks, I started earlier in the week with some principles of predator-prey-like interactions between virus and microbes and consequences from population to evolutionary dynamics to even co-evolutionary dynamics. And then in the Tuesday lecture, began to go in a slightly different direction, confronting these paradigms by looking specifically at outcomes of infection at the cellular scale that don't necessarily lead to lysis and the production of more virus particles, but instead uh, potentially long-term associations in which the fates of the virus and the host become entangled. And today I will revisit again the lytic paradigm in a specific uh, context, an applied context, where we'll try to leverage what we know about bacteriophage, bacteria interactions with the purpose in mind that is to try and improve treatment of multidrug resistant infections. And obviously that's clearly motivated by a real world application. And to focus on this real world application, I would remind folks, many of you probably don't need reminding that in addition to SARS-CoV-2, there are a lot of other hazards around. And one of the biggest ones that continues to, to be a problem globally is the emergence and spread of multi-drug resistant bacterial infections. And the CDC categorized these in different levels and the levels have to do A, with the extent of harm of the pathogen, but also the extent to which we are running short of therapeutics, including last line therapeutics or therapeutics that themselves cause harm when given. And these here are some of these listed strep groups and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, multidrug resistant Staph aureus, Nicaea gonorrhea, C. diff, and so on. And the issue here spans obviously one not only impacts now, but looking forward to the extent to which there are those who are concerned, one of the most prominent uh, I would say statements on this topic is this O'Neill report looking at deaths attributable to antimicrobial resistance AMR every year now compared to other majors of causes of death. And the challenge, of course, looking forward 30 plus years is the danger that uh, would be associated with the spread of these multidrug resistant infections that would then be untreatable and estimates that uh, rival the, even that of cancer in terms of mortality. And in terms of some of the research spending, you can see that at present there just has not been the same prioritization within the NIH. Obviously that is changing, but more needs to be done to really to move this uh, field forward. And part of this is that for a very long time, may, no major new types or class of antibiotics were developed. There were some recent discoveries that, that provide some optimism with respect to discoveries based on environmental microbes, including texabactin. Uh, but again, the crisis here is a serious one already and is bound to get worse unless we really start to confront and take new approaches to address uh, how, to, uh, how to treat anti, uh, antimicrobial resistant infections, particularly those that are multidrug resistant. And one of the ways that people have begun to reconsider is to use phage. And I reminded you earlier in the week or explain to you if you hadn't heard before, that phage are highly abundant in natural systems where there can be tens of millions, if not more virus particles per milliliter in natural systems, whether in water, aquatic system, soil, 
and other microbiomes. And these can become the basis for candidates, right? A natural wet reservoir, as it were, of potential treatments. This study and, and kind of broad scope uh, description of uh, virus host impacts is described in this book by Carl Zimmer. But my point here on the right is that there's this diversity of potential treatments that if we can harness, may be used productively to try to treat these infections. And in fact, this is increasingly what has happened. A few years ago, this is now five years ago, there was a first multi-center clinical study of phage therapy in serious burn victims. And the idea was to try not just as a compassionate use case, but do an industry standard clinical trial to look at both tolerance and effectiveness, not just does it not do harm or is it tolerated, but it actually is effective in, in treating antibody resistant infections. And this was meant specifically on burn wound patients so that the presumption here at the outset was that these could be colonized by either E. coli or Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and there would be a control and would be compared against the usual treatment uh, and to see if the phage treatment uh, showed a benefit. Now, the problem about a year later was there was a series of delays, size and scope, and in fact, there just weren't enough participants included in the trial to get the kind of power they needed to determine efficacy. And part of that was because the design of the trial uh, presumed that they were going to use a cocktail of phage against a single type of pathogen, E. coli or Pseudomonas. And of course, what is unfolding in, in many of these wounds is that these are complex communities. And so they weren't able to actually do have the right inclusion criteria and only a dozen plus of the intended hundreds plus patients were included. You can see that even if that were to work in those 15, you just wouldn't have the power to make those calls. Nonetheless, the, even though this was a bit of a setback, there have been a number of promising developments. And those are often through compassionate use cases. These are two well-known examples. On the left, uh, Tom Patterson, who was in a coma and near death and was treated uh, with a phage cocktail. And this is, was a collaborative effort that was using essentially information on phage of Acidobacter baumani as a way to treat this infection. And this has, again, been well documented. You can read about this particular story. Uh, his wife has, has described quite a lot of the story as well. And a similar story, this is again by Carl Zimmer. And you can see here on the bottom right, this is Paul Turner from Yale. And you can hear more about his work also on, online in slides where he, again, literally these viruses fished out of a lake may have saved a man's life in advanced science. These phage found in natural systems, which were able to infect and lyse Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and I'll just talk a little bit more about this particular system and the rationale, were used to treat this fistula. So there was a lung associated infection. And again, that was another example of a compassionate use case. And, and Paul and his team, including Ben Chan, uh, have done this multiple times now, successfully treating individuals using uh, Pseudomonas phage. This has led to initiatives that go beyond compassionate use cases, but to the, to the scale of uh, institutes, clinical trials, uh, and even uh, really institutes dedicated to phage therapy, including treatments not just of Pseudomonas and Pseudobacter baumani, but here's an example from Mycobacterium from Graham Hatfield Schooley, Helen and Spencer and colleagues. So if you can look in the past few years, you'll see an increase in interest, a significant increase in interest with respect to using phage as the basis for treating these multi-drug resistant infections in a diversity of pathogens. But of course, if we go backwards in time to the origins and just coming past uh, really almost the centennial anniversary of the discovery of phage from the very outset, Felix Darrell and colleagues were thinking about therapeutics as one of the potential uses of this new discovery, right? Bacteriophage, phagos, meaning to devour this organism, this virus that was able to devour bacteria. And here's an example from his book after being assured that no harmful effects attended the ingestion of the Shiga bacteriophage, this treatment was applied for therapeutic purposes to treat dysentery. 
And so from the very outset, Felix Derrell and colleagues thought about phage, of course, then over time, this was supplanted by the widespread avail availability of antibiotics, but we now face new challenges. And the critique has been to some extent with respect to phage therapy, that there's not been some transformative development or technology, that means it's open season. Now, of course, the need is greater because of the emergence of multidrug resistant infection. The question is, is there been a development that could say that the chances of using this effectively have increased? And I would argue that the answer to that is actually yes, there has been developments, not only on the genomics or engineering side to improve the, let's say the production and, and characterization of phage that are available for treatment, but, but even the principles really ecosystem aware principles. And I think this is why it really fits in to this uh, workshop, because these are really ecosystem aware principles that are now being used to try to improve treatment. And one of them has been developed by Paul Turner and colleagues. And I've given you three references here in the bottom left in case you're interested in following. And the idea there is that a virus, and I'll get back to this at the end of my talk, a virus and an antibody can be used together. There's a particular class of efflux pumps in which essentially bacteria pump out antibiotics so that they are not affected by them or, or continue to, to divide and, and, and proliferate. Yet phage can adsorb to these efflux pumps and uses as a means to gain access and entry to the cell. So if you apply both at the same time, you can see how this could provide an evolutionary trap. If on the one hand, the bacteria, some bacteria were to mutate and block this efflux pump so phage can't get in, but then the antibiotic can't get out. And if they don't mutate uh, that particular efflux pump, well then sure the antibiotics can get out, but the phage can get in. And this is precisely the rationale by using antibiotics in these particular efflux pump targeting phage together uh, that Paul Turner, Ben Chan and others have, have managed to push this forward. The other idea I'd like to talk about with respect to synergy, again, in ecosystem or synergy is our work collaboratively with Laurent de Barbu and colleagues to think about phage not as the only actor in the system, but rather as part of an ecosystem in which there critically are immune cells. And I will try to explain today how phage may not necessarily be the sole sterilizing agent, as it were, of bacteria in the system, but rather are working synergistically with the immune system, or we can think of them as working synergistically with the immune system to eliminate bacteria. And if we think about that, that transforms uh, the scope in which uh, bacteriophage therapy may be more effective and also gives us some indication in which it may not be effective. So what I'll try to do today is really span this scale from models to mice and talk about uh, routes towards a modern immunophage therapy. And I will do this in three parts, again, with the interest of trying to be, have a self-contained lecture. And I know for those of you who were here at the prior two, the first part, I, each time I make this first part a little shorter, but I will just keep this in mind as the motivation for new principles underlying immunophage synergy, going beyond just phage bacteria interactions, but including immune components, and then talk about work on curative treatment uh, of otherwise fatal respiratory diseases using bacteriophage and immunomodulated mice, as well as return to some of the issues involved in uh, antibiotic phage synergy. Okay, so in this first part, as I've described earlier in the week, the paradigm for these lytic phage bacteria interactions originated in many ways with Campbell in 1961, but also Bruce Levin in the late 70s, the idea that there's a prey, the bacteria and the predator, the virus, and this means that we can think about the dynamics arising in terms of some predator prey uh, cycles in the absence of that temperate mode, which I talked about on Tuesday. In these models, to remind folks, we have some carbon source, some nutrient, some bacteria, some virus. There's going to be new resource coming in, resources going out. These resources will be taken up, leading to division of the cells, infection, and lysis. And you see these oscillations. And again, the key point here for phage therapy is if we want to get rid of the bacteria, it's important to keep in mind 
that in these kinds of models, we don't necessarily expect, although there could be large excursions, we don't necessarily expect generically that the virus that can kill one cell will eliminate the population, but rather will drop down the population density, but coexist with it. And that's the point of the slide that there will be the, uh, these cycles, but it doesn't lead to the joint extinction. It leads to coexistence, albeit at a lower density. Of course, we have to consider the fact that there's more microscopic mechanisms and there can be delays between adsorption and lysis. But even in those cases, again, we don't find that the addition of phage and the absence of other factors need lead to the elimination of the host, but in contrast could lead to coexistence and oscillations. So we have this virus that we'd like to add in a phage therapeutic sense, but from an ecological perspective, thinking about these as prey prey dynamics, if we've eliminated this temperate phage route, we expect there to be coexistence and likely to be oscillations. As I've also shown, these oscillations can be problematic, not only because it means the host hasn't been eliminated, but also because evolution can happen and resistant hosts can emerge. And so this initial phage that you might have wanted to use as a therapeutic, sure it will be effective on some, but maybe not all of the hosts that one is targeting. So the reason I bring this up today as part of this talk is because if we think about trying to use phage as a therapeutic, it does provide a counterpoint to some of the standard assumptions of phage therapy. Yes, viruses can kill individual cells, sure. But that doesn't mean they eliminate entire host population. In fact, we should expect they may coexist with host populations and may even lead the evolution of resistance to the loss of top-down control. So instead of controlling at some low densities, we may be back exactly where we started, where now we have uh, a phage-resistant bacteria and we have lost the, the efficacy of this candidate therapeutic. And you can read more about this, as I said, in my book for some of the context that goes into why these principles hold. The field is aware to some extent of these issues and there's been a approach to respond to them. And that approach are cocktails, not the kind of things you might have at uh, 6 p.m. in Milan in normal times when you're having a spritz or whatever it is one has in, in the aperitivo, I believe it's called, which would be a delight to have and share. But these are different kinds of cocktails. These cocktails involve a combination of bacteriophage, each with a different sort of feature. And you can see a schematic here on the upper left. The idea might be that if there are target bacteria, maybe some of them get stopped on the outside, some of them get stopped on the inside, but there may be enough coverage here that the bacteria are gonna be lysed by this collection of diverse phage. And if you go to Georgia, the other Georgia uh, in the former uh, Soviet Republic, these are actually available as OTC phage, over the counter phage. You can buy them at a pharmacy. There's been some question marks vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what is exactly in some of these OTC phage. Is it just phage or maybe also antibiotics? And there's been efforts certainly to engineer phage to have different characteristics, for example, different targeting receptors and even uh, different contents, in other words, gene contents, so that they can deliver uh, different, uh, uh, whether it's toxins or other, um, other features that may uh, lead to the lysis of target cells. So this is good news in some respect, but we have to keep in mind that some of the concerns of standard phage therapy still remain even with cocktails. Yes, cocktails may kill more, but not all. And there may be trade-offs with coverage because you're making a choice about which particular uh, phage to use. And, and if you have in some sense a constraint of the total density of phage that you're able to combine. Moreover, we see natural systems that are diverse, that are coexisting with host populations. And it's true theoretically, as I described in my Monday lecture, that there can be coexistence, albeit just amongst more diverse communities. So you may be using this complex cocktail, we just may have a situation where now there's complex coexistence rather than a single oscillatory dynamic. And yet there still can be this problem of evolution. Now it may be slowed, but there's 
now in some sense, just a more complex Luria Delbruck experiment where there can still be that kind of escapement. Okay, so that in some sense points us in the direction of, of new principles. And I'll begin to explain those in a moment. Are there any questions at this stage? I don't imagine there'll be so many given I'm covering things, but with a particular purpose in mind. So there is no question uh, in the chat uh, of Zoom or in the YouTube chat, but if anyone wants to raise hand and ask a question, I think it's a good uh, moment to do that. I imagine there'll be more questions after part two, once uh, we've I've set it up. Okay, so let me just keep going here. So this kind of gives us a, a, a direction to be somewhat skeptical about um, uh, bacteriophage therapy, but I'll try to explain why other things are happening that may give us more confidence. So let me give you a contrast. Everything I just said basically implies like, well, why is this working? Why should this even work yet? Certainly within the mirroring model, within, within mice, and obviously there are these compassionate use cases that seem quite promising. There have been controlled studies, and this is one by Laurent de Barbu from about a decade ago, in which mice are infected with an acute respiratory model of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You can see here, Notably, these have a fluorescent mode so that you can actually visualize the spread of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the control versus in the phage treated mice. And you can see the difference here in terms of intensity. And on the right, you can see the outcomes in terms of survival between what happens when you don't use phage, one to 10 ratio, and here as many phage as there are bacteria or 10 times as many. And there's a contrast here between no mice surviving and all of the mice surviving. So clearly this is working. At some level, this actually works despite everything I just told you. So I think this should raise questions and raise questions about principles by which what may hold for a phage bacteria system, the absence of other players may fundamentally be altered uh, in the context uh, of an immune system. And in fact, Bruce Levin, Jim Bull proposed an early model to try to explain some of the differences. And their ideas are shown here where you have bacteria which can be infected in lice by phage leading to more phage. These bacteria may stimulate an immune response and the stimulated immune response may therefore inhibit the growth of bacteria through immune killing. This is the schematic. And now you're comfortable with these kinds of equations. Here we have bacteria viruses, the immune response. There's an implicit resource model here, which I've, I've left out. So there's cell division, infection, and immune killing. Note the virus particles are leaving from the outside, but then being regenerated tau later, right? Um, when a burst beta are produced, and there's also viral decay. And we see here, we also have immune stimulation. So there's more bacteria leads to more, immune response, and this immune response directly leads to killing. So this was the model they proposed, and they made these claims that when there were, was an active immune response, then there was a marked difference from the case in which uh, there was not, and I'll try to explain the difference here. Here we have in the absence of phage, uh, a case in which you have susceptible and resistant populations, and here we have only the immune response. And what you can see is that here there's a threshold. They imagine that would be a critical bound leading to the mortality of this particular organism. And their claim is when you add phage, the system goes up, but it never crosses this critical bound. And the phage are in some sense responsible for the elimination of these sensitive bacteria. Although this is a, a good idea and it is very promising, there's also somewhat of a problem here. First of all, you'll notice that in this case, without phage, the bacteria were eliminated after about 12 hours, but when you add the phage, it actually seems to take longer to eliminate the bacteria. And the other issue is that if I were to move this threshold just a little bit, then in fact, even in this case, we might still have a crossing. That generically, you don't need phage to eliminate the bacteria in this first model. So why do we even need this in the first place? This model seems to imply that the immune system always works, which clearly is not the case. So we tried to modify this Levin-Bull model and extend it in two key ways. First of all, 
by implying that the immune stimulation has a capacity. It can't just keep growing without bounds. First of all, that can itself cause damage, but also there's a limit to the extent to which the immune response uh, can be stimulated. And the other part is that bacteria can initiate density dependent defenses, whether through quorum sensing or biofilms or virulence factors that can evade the immune response. So even a stimulated immune system may not be able to eliminate bacteria once the bacterial density gets high enough. So you see this term, new term in the denominator. So these two red terms here, these negative feedback loops, this first one is carrying capacity and here's a density dependent response. What happens in this model? Okay, so it's the same model more or less as the Levin Bull model, except with these two additional biological features. First of all, if we were to get rid of the immune system, just ask what happens when we add bacteria and phage together, we see coexistence as we expect with these kind of predator prey models. On the other hand, if we eliminate the phage, then unlike the Levin and Bull model in which bacteria are eliminated, here, in fact, bacteria increase and get to a point where they reach a steady state. The immune response is on, but can't eliminate the bacteria. In other words, there's an infection. And yet when all are combined, what you can see is that we have these dynamics between phage and bacteria, the immune response is turning on, and eventually actually the bacteria does get eliminated only when both are together. So neither alone can do it, but together they can. And what you can also see here notably is that the phage disappear in some way are locally extinct before that of the bacteria. So you can even understand here that in the end, it is the immune system in this model that fundamentally eliminates the bacteria rather than the phage. And what the phage are doing in some sense are dropping the densities of bacteria to a level that can be controlled by an immune response. So this is what we call immunophage synergy. It's the elimination of bacteria through this tripartite dynamics. And just to point out here that this doesn't always work, but notably it can work in a larger regime that we initially expected. Here are results for the final state of bacterial density and phage densities as a function of the decay rate, meaning fast decay of viruses inside the host and slow rates and the adsorption of phage to bacteria. So on this upper left, we have long lasting phage that are very good at, at, at absorbing and lysing cells. And down here on the lower right, these are rapidly decaying phage that don't do a good job. And as you can see that in this bottom section, we expect and find both theoretically and then via simulations that we have bacteria and the phage can't get a foothold and are eliminated. When you see both colors, that means there's a coexistence regime. And initially we expected this only to work in this upper left-hand wedge, but we actually found a larger regime where the bacteria were eliminated and therefore also the phage, but that's okay. And this is through a dynamic mechanism that these oscillations uh, in abundance can actually lead to opportunities in the troughs where the immune system can eliminate the bacteria and then the phage as well. So we have a large regime and parameter space where we expect that immunophage synergy is possible. And just to give a synopsis here, in other words, there's a bacterial uh, uh, introduction which proliferates, the immune system responds but is unable to clear it. The addition of phage, whether because it breaks up biofilms or just directly reduces densities, means there's a decrease in density. And with a decrease in density, the immune system can uh, overcome the bacteria, also leading to the elimination of phage. So those are the key ideas that make this different that really thinks of bacteriophage therapy as part of an ecosystem and thinking about feedbacks in that system. So maybe now there may be questions before I move on to the later parts. Yes, there is uh, <clears throat> one question from the chat um, uh, from Silvia who asks, uh, with respect to antibiotic therapy, does phage therapy have the potential to be more bacteria specific? and cause less side effects on the good microbial community? Right, that's one of the key benefits uh, of using phage. It also is the one of the key negative parts of using phage because of the specific nature of phage rather than broad spectrum antibiotics. It means that you have to make sure that the phage can target the specific bacteria that one has, which is another reason why people use cocktails, but it should not have the same side effects as targeting other cells. So it is both good and bad news 
uh, with respect to use. Great. Any other question? Yes, there is one question from Ankit, please. Uh, hi. Uh, so I was just wondering, like, since you were talking about coexistence and elimination, like, uh, do you also sometimes consider systems where you might have a very large number of bacteria species and uh, yeah, and right. it's maybe different, yeah, pathogens? Let me uh, try to answer in two ways. First of all, we are looking at acute infections. And part of the reason I, my group has been focusing on acute infections is I think, frankly, the, the challenge of using bacteriophage to eliminate a complex multi-species community is going to be harder. That's really steering complex networks. Nonetheless, in this next part, I will address what happens when there are resistant mutants and how do you deal with the fact that this is not just one bacteria type, but actually there can be susceptible and resistant types. So in that sense, I will address it. But in the broader sense, that remains a big challenge of how does one, in some sense, use phage either to steer or influence or control complex bacteria communities and that would be relevant, for example, to gut communities or even some of these surface communities. We're focusing on these acute infections purposefully. Thanks. Right. And I would say that even in the treatment, for example, of bacteriophage, I'll, I'll note though, Paul Turner is working in, in CF and treating CF patients. And then absolutely, there are complex communities, but there tends to be a disproportionate impact of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So there can still be significant benefits. So uh, you know, those compassionate use cases are in situations where the community is more complex, even if they're targeting a subset. Thanks. Yep. Great. Any other question? I'll keep going. Yeah. Oh, uh, there is one. <clears throat> With the uh, concern that the elimination of bacteria uh, Okay, uh, with the concern uh, that the elimination of bacteria will be more effective with the synergistic involvement of phage and of the immune system, how will the bacteria elimination work in uh, immunodeficient, immunocompromised? Uh, well, that's, that's a great question, because if you look at the title of the slide, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> okay. So that person, whoever that was, we, we can, let's get to it. Okay. Okay. So this third part, we're going to address precisely the question that this uh, individual raised, which is what happens in immunodeficient or immunomodulated systems. So let's go and try to deal with that. So this goes back now a few years. Um, everyone here recognizes Liverpool. If you've ever been to Liverpool, you'll notice that they've modified uh, the central church to have this giant phage capsid on top. You might not have noticed that this was just for the display. Uh, and this the theme here is really I get by with a little help from my friends because this became not just a theory project, but really a collaborative theory project spanning both the US and France. One of the first presenters on this session was Dwayne Roach, formerly of Pasteur at the time, but now recently professor, assistant professor at San Diego State University. And they were doing, in parallel, unbeknownst to us, an experimental study of phage therapy efficacy in immunomodulated mice, precisely the point we've just raised. In other words, taking a multi-drug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is that same system that I showed you from Laurent in 2010, which causes uh, acute pneumonia, and, which is fatal in mice, and treating with PAC-P1, which was shown, as I showed in that 2010 study, to prevent fatal acute pneumonia when given at least at one-to-one uh, uh, -one or 10-to-one levels in vivo. And again, I've shown you this before. Here we have these readouts hours post-treatment of the control versus the phage therapy treated mice showing the effectiveness of phage therapy. Here we have complete difference in terms of survivorship, no survivorship in the control group, 100% in the phage group. Here we have radiance measurements, which get to be at levels of detection after one, two, or three days and remain there. Whereas the saline treated mice then uh, via the compassionate uh, treatment then are not extended because uh, they show distress and all die after 24 hours. However, using the same phage in a different mouse model, and here I'm only denoting this word anti-GR1, which I will get back to later, what you can see is that we have the original treatment and then we have a treatment and the phage treatment in this modulated mouse. And in all cases, 
even though one is using this phage that was effective in the immunocompetent mice, it is no longer viable in this modified system. Here with radiants that look no different uh, post-infection. Again, the two hours notes the fact that phage are added two hours after infection, just to contrast, these are days and this is hours post-infection. Okay. And although this is not good news, obviously, for these particular mice, this is good news with respect to the idea and, the, and advancing principles of trying to be more effective of how and when to use bacteriophage. And the challenge, of course, here is that we have to then bridge the gap between these in vitro models and in vivo outcomes. So we initiate a collaboration with Duane and with Laurent and their team. And we had these discussions and we figured, well, you know, we our models are basically predicting this. We, I had a poster without any experimental data at the time. They had experiments without any theory. We got together and chatted and we began to adapt it to the particular absorption rates and burst sizes and other details of the system. And this is what happened at first. Here is in our model, two hours after uh, the sensitive bacteria are increasing, host immunity is re responding. We add phage. And if you can see, there's like a cliff and Clearly something has gone wrong. It's a miracle cure. So in our models initially, it looked like a miracle cure. Even with phage and bacteria, you didn't even need the immune system. And the reason is that at the absorption rates that they expected and the birth size and latent periods and so on, it seemed that this many bacteria would immediately lead to clearance. And clearly that's not the case. So there was a gap here in terms of time scales uh, and the models that we developed in a well-mixed chemostat that is not exactly how things work in the lungs of a mouse, that if a bacteria is killed on one lobe by a phage, that doesn't mean the phage immediately gains access to bacteria in the other lobe. The other issue, of course, is that we have to think more carefully about the immune side. Can we diagnose the basis of this? Which are the effector cells that might be involved in this synergistic clearance? So the first thing that we uh, revisited was this notion of a linear attack rate. And in some ways, it's inspired by work in epidemiology, where it's well known that heterogeneous mixing can lead to nonlinear interaction rates. We began to think about modifying this, in some sense, force of infection, this absorption rate, not based on linear contact rates, but nonlinear contact rates due to heterogeneous mixing. And also, another problem here is, has to do with phage saturation, that locally there may be elevated levels of phage. But if they are infecting the same bacteria, they don't get to kill it more than once. And in a linear model, in some sense, they do. And so here we also took into account another way in which there may be a nonlinear response between phage density and absorption and killing due to phage saturation. And I'll refer to these as HM and PS for these different functional forms. We then took this model in which we have phage and bacteria and an immune system, but instead of having this linear term here, we used this heterogeneous mixing model or a phage saturation model and found instead of having timescales of basically instantaneous elimination, it took about a day using the same parameter, related parameter sets for bacteria to be cleared. Here you can see it in these two models. We also did the same thing with resistance. And here, I think there becomes another insight, which is throughout this, I have phage only targeting these sensitive bacteria, phage sensitive bacteria. On the other hand, there can be resistant bacteria. And the question is, how does phage, how do phage and immune uh, effector cells together lead to the elimination when the phage cannot eliminate these infect and lyse, these resistant cells? The outcome, as you can see, is elimination of both. And the rationale is as follows, which is that there can be the proliferation of resistant bacteria but because phage are targeting and eliminating sensitive bacteria, that the stimulated immune response can then, in the absence of these large numbers of sensitive bacteria, can eliminate the much smaller numbers of resistant bacteria. And someone drew a red line on my slide, which is really cool. I don't know how that happened. Um, but you can see then that this then is controlled not by the phage, but rather by immunity. And so this also gives an insight as to why this is very different than the version I explained before, 
that by making these models explicit, you can see that there can be, despite the emergence of resistance, as long as there is this uh, notion of an ecosystem and immune cells, a chance for phage therapy to work, even if we don't target every particular resistant mutant, there's still a chance that this can work. However, we don't quite know which of the immune effector cells are gonna be responsible for this particular synergy. Uh, and one of the ways in which they probed this was to take uh, different uh, types of immunomodulated mice and use the same system. And one of these is called MITE88-, which is immunity activation deficient mouse. In other words, the signaling is deficient. So you can see here an example of survival and radiance. And here we have the uh, wild type saline case, but here are these immunodeficient mice in which when you add phage, the survivorship is no longer 100%, but drops down. And what you can see here in radiance is that they seem to be the same. The phage looks like it may be improving things, but then there's a reversal. And that reversal in our models, we also expect it to happen because the phage are eliminating the sensitive bacteria but resistant bacteria are increasing. And because the immune system is present, but it's not responding correctly, then there's the uncontrolled proliferation of resistant bacteria. And in fact, that's precisely what they found when they actually looked and isolated these bacteria at the end, they were all resistant to the phage. So just in the model as in the system, it's the proliferation of resistant bacteria in the absence of immune control that leads uh, to the failure of therapy which then points to innate effector cells. And I'll just point out that one of the interesting stories uh, that they explored was examining the potential for phage therapy to work in the absence of innate and adaptive lymph sites. And it turns out it could. So the synergy is not with innate lymphoid B cells or T cells. And obviously the adaptive part may be less surprising, but the fact that it wasn't with the innate lymphoid cells is promising and also suggested that the synergy was likely to be with neutrophils. And that is in fact what I showed you in that first system when you have these neutropenic or de depleted, uh, uh, neutrophil depleted mice, then yes, in fact, the addition of phage does not lead to survival and you see the uncontrolled proliferation of bacteria. So again, as I said, pointing to the synergy between neutrophils and phage, as being a, an essential alliance required for effective therapy. And I'll make one more point here before wrapping up this section, uh, which is that you can also use this as a prophylactic in the sense that you know, in a few experiments, they added phages four days in advance and then added the bacteria and still it was effective at preventing infection and fatalities of the mice. 100% of these pretreated mice survived and none of those treated with saline. And we also expected this to happen. The reason why we examined this case is because in certain circumstances, there was concern that the turnover or decay of phage would be so fast. And in blood treatments that's shown to be very fast, but they had done the work just looking uh, at the decay, which seemed to be on the order of nine to 10 hours, which meant that a large dose given four days before there was still gonna be enough around um, in terms of the decay of phage for this to be effective as it was. And the other interesting point here is that it doesn't seem uh, to have at least the addition of these phage to lead to differential production of cytokines. In other words, there wasn't an immune response that might directly target the phage on its own, right? Which would also be problematic and that would maybe limit the efficiency of phage therapy. At the moment, as you, you can see, I'm thinking about phage and bacteria, phage and the immune system synergizing with respect to elimination of bacteria and adverse uh, impacts on phage by the immune system could obviously limit that, but there's no evidence of significant priming of host immunity. So maybe that's a good place to stop as well, just in case I have a few, few last slides. I think I'm mostly on time. Yes, so there, there are a couple of questions. So one is, from the Zoom chat uh, from Leihan, who is asking uh, the following. So biologists have been using vectors to do genetic manipulations. Is this one of the ways to design phages to target specific bacteria? bacteria? 
Right, so there's all sorts of different ways if you want to modify bacteria, CRISPR system, phage delivery systems, and so on. In this particular case, we're really thinking about phage not as a means to modify, you know, as a way to deliver something, but rather to kill and proliferate. So this, nothing I'm saying today would prevent interesting work in those directions, but really thinking of phage as agents of mortality here of course, you could also think of using a phage-derived product, like a lysin, as an agent of mortality. And people are using lysins also as, uh, whether pretreatments or therapeutics, but I'm not investigating a particular case of using phage as delivery vectors in this study. That would be interesting, but it's not what the scope of this particular work. Yes, I, I think uh, he has a related, very related question. Um, which is to get the, the immune cells in action, can one use phages to make bacteria express some peptides that, that are already known as pathogens to immune cells? So I would just say that we're exploring some of those things now. I don't have any rules. I now understand what the person's going at. That has been of interest to us to do something more than just killing in light of this synergy. Uh, and we don't have any results to share yet, but yes, that is certainly of interest to us. Yes. Then there is a, a question from the YouTube chat. Chat. So uh, Julio is asking, uh, would it be possible to apply ideas from control theory, uh, optimal control, stochastic control, to this system, such as uh, in the immunophage synergy model? Yes, and we have a paper out this year in the Bolton of Mathematical Biology which does that. I, I didn't include that because I had. I was going to run out of time and I included a different study that came out in M Systems. But if that individual is interested, you can look at Guanlin Lee et al. We've collaborated with Yorai Wardi, who's a control theorist here at Georgia Tech, to do precisely that. And I'll just make a comment that the challenge always in optimal control is that you have a sense of timing, but we all can worry about misspecification of the model. And so in that paper, what we did is try to take the lessons from our optimal control results and use them to guide um, something that could be done in practice, which is the delivery at the outset of what we think is the right dose and combination. And we're also looking to try to convert that more into a feedback control case by taking data, not just at the outset and projecting forward in time, but also taking new measurements and responding appropriately. So we're actively working on that as part of an NIH grant that funds a study. And you can see our first work in that direction, again, in Lee et al. with myself and Yorai Wardi and Joy Leung in the Bolton Mathematical Biology 2020. Great. Uh, if there is not any other question, I think you can uh, go to the next. Oh, uh, OK. There is one question in the Zoom chat um, by Sri Rama. Is competition and or cooperation play any role in controllability? I assume that person is referring to maybe competition or cooperation between bacteria? Yes. Maybe. Uh, if so, I certainly would think that this goes back to the, my point about using phage to treat multi-component infections, right? Multi-species infections. And then Absolutely, we need to be thinking about those kinds of interactions. Here, within a species, if we have systems, particularly in cases like CF, or that have a longer time to develop biofilms, then if I think of that as a cooperation mechanism within uh, bacteria of the same species, then also, yes, we'd have to think about ways to address issues of uh, emergent properties of populations that may then lead to recalcitrance or making it different, uh, more difficult to treat with phage if phage can't penetrate those biofilms or somehow overcome those collective defenses. Yes, great. Uh, okay, so yeah. I only have a few minutes left, so maybe I'll go to this fourth part. Is that okay? Yeah. So let me now go in one direction and, and again, I, uh, I didn't add the optimal control work, but uh, wanted to get back to this example from Paul Turner and just elaborate a little bit more on it, which is, again, to recall that there are pseudomonas originosa that use these antibiotic efflux pumps. 
So in other words, if an antibiotic is present, they can be pumped out, increasing survival, but yet this phage OMK1 uses these efflux pumps in some sense as, an, uh, as a surface receptor to inject genetic material into the host. Of course, there could be a mutation, which means that some pseudomonas may have uh, lost this uh, efflux pump, or at least uh, do not have the surface receptor, so that now they can no longer pump out antibiotics, but of course, phage can't get in. So in these two examples, and there may be a continuum of expression here, there may be, at least on the archetype side, antibiotic sensitive types, which are also phage resistant, and antibiotic resistant types, which are phage sensitive. And this is precisely the rationale behind the dual use of antibiotics and phage together. And this is what it was reported in really a pioneering study by Benjamin Chan et al. with Paul Turner as the senior author leading the study and describing it here. There's a caveat though that concerned us that there may be issues about targeting the wrong strain. So for example, if there is a phage sensitive inoculum Right. At the beginning, then using phage may work, whereas if the initial community is largely phage resistant, right, but antibiotic, uh, here in this particular case, I haven't added the antibiotics, then even all the things I said before about immunophage synergy may no longer work because if it's the bulk of which are resistant bacteria, they may rise to such high densities that we don't get the benefits of them being driven down. So this is just to point out that once we have sensitive and resistant cells, then targeting really matters. And we think this also matters with respect to the, uh, this antibiotic phage joint treatment. So what we did is take our original model and instead of just having phage and immune cells and a sensitive uh, and resistant type, we also are gonna have uh, including antibiotic and I'll label these two bacteria with A and P, meaning A is sensitive to antibiotics and P is sensitive to phage, right? So now we have a specific kind of mutation which just doesn't make it resistant, but now becomes sensitive to the use of antibiotic. And we wanted to explore what might happen in these kinds of models. One of the things that we realized initially is that a combination therapy might restore efficacy to mistargeted phage therapy. So if the inoculum was initially phage sensitive, and one adds phage, and that's going to work. But if it's an antibiotic sensitive inoculum and you use phage, then of course you're just going to get the emergence of these BA types. However, the combination therapy here in both cases, there's a background antibiotic applied, can lead to elimination in both. So, our first point here is that we think that in this class of systems, clearly this phage antibiotic combination is going to be better, irrespective of what the initial breakdown of that population is. Right, whether it tends to be more on the sensitive to bacteria side, phage side or to antibiotics. The other thing that I think is important is it the inclusion of immune responses, we think again is an implicit and hidden part of what makes this effective. So we went and explored the outcomes of combination therapy with immunity. And you can see in both cases, we get an elimination. But in the absence of an immune response, we end up getting again, this persistence of phage and bacteria with some background lower levels of these antibiotic sensitive bacteria. They're being reduced by the use of antibiotics, but the phage and antibiotics, even though they're working synergistically, can't clear things because phage, that intrinsic relation between phage and bacteria means that we end up getting generically coexistence rather than elimination. So we tried to put this all together envisioning that we have variation of the inoculum type here, all antibiotic sensitive, all phage sensitive, the level of antibiotic, and here is the MIC concentration, the minimum inhibitory concentration. And what I'm showing you here are bacterial densities only with antibiotics, which you end up getting is, except in this very corner case, essentially the elimination of the antibiotic sensitive types, but the persistence of bacteria that are sensitive to phage. When you add immune uh, responses, so if there's an active immune response, there's some regime in which there's clearance, but there's still a large regime in which there's not. 
when antibiotics and phage are added together, but not having the immune system, you can see that in all these cases, we don't expect elimination despite the synergy. Although densities are driven lower, there still are persistent levels. And when you use a lot of antibiotics, then instead of having the antibiotic sensitive bacteria, you get largely phage sensitive bacteria. When you don't use much antibiotics below the MIC, you get antibiotic sensitive bacteria. So in other words, you're selecting for the type, but not eliminating them. But notably, when all of these players come together, we expect a large regime, including in the sub-inhibitory concentration levels where there's robust elimination of the bacteria. And only when you basically don't use much antibiotics at all, you end up selecting for these antibiotic sensitive types. Okay? So the point here is that the combination of antibiotics and phage is good, and it's particularly robust when there is an active immune system. So the conclusions here, I hope I've explained this tripartite model of phage immune bacteria dynamics, it really is an ecosystem aware approach. And thinking about phage as part of an ecosystem may also redirect our attention to how to think about the development of therapeutics. That in vivo analysis shows that the curative success is not just dependent on the phage, but also on the immune response. That a phage neutrophil alliance in terms of uh, is maybe necessary for therapy and that was revealed with these immunomodulated mice studies. And also synergy can help resolve the resistance problems because the immune response can eliminate both susceptible and resistant pathogen. And we're working now on generalized symmetry to include commensals, I didn't talk about that today, as well as antibiotics. And also keeping in mind that once we are aware of these kinds of feedbacks, it may be that trying to get candidate phage, we should be thinking about ways in which phage can make it easier for the immune response to work rather than thinking of the efficacy of killing on its own. And with that, uh, again, just wanna thank collaborators here pointing out, I've talked about this M systems paper here at the end, but also there is that other Boldman math bio paper, uh, which focuses on control theory and additional thanks to our experimental collaborators at Pasteur, as well as to the Turner group at Yale for their collaboration on this theory analysis uh, of their fascinating uh, uh, antibiotic and phage evolutionary trade-off mechanism. And with that, I'll be happy to take a few last questions. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Joshua, for this very nice uh, lecture. So the, we have time for questions. Um, I don't see any question in the chat, either on Zoom or YouTube. If you have any, please, either write it or uh, raise your hand. Yes, there is a question by Martina, please. Um, uh, hi, Joshua, it's always nice to hear you, to hear your lectures. Uh, I, mm, it's a bit, of a, a bit of a leap, I think, uh, because uh, there is all this idea that, uh, uh, let's say the right quantity of phages might uh, uh, promote uh, bacterial diversity. And in this sense, uh, uh, we might can so in a in a, in a probably far away future. Do you think we could use uh, phages to uh, as probiotics? Phages as probiotics. Yeah. Okay, and instead of bacteria as probiotic, but using uh, say phage in some sense, I think I guess it depends on how we're going to think about the term probiotics. Right, um, meaning, do you want them to be residents? Because maybe if we add phage that are hanging out and eliminating the wrong bacteria, that could be good. But maybe you mean something else, like you'd actually like them to become residents, which implies yeah, uh, like a, for the gut microbiome, in the right. sense that uh, you need uh, a diverse community, and right. uh, well. So, so there's an interesting paper a, a few years ago, and it's a shame that I, I'm dropping the name of the first author, but the last author is Mark Young. It was published in PNAS uh, on a healthy gut virome, which looked at the relationship between, in some sense, the diversity of phage and outcomes with respect to health, finding that they were related. And I think there are many questions left to be answered about mechanisms. Is that 
essentially a reflection of healthy gut microbiome where we see phage of those microbes, or is it actually the inclusion of phage that is leading directly to health benefits? I don't think we know the answer to that. But I think the fact that you're raising it, in some talks I've made a schematic, I wish I had it here, of a yogurt with extra phage. Because you know that when people will go to the store and pay lots more money for Activia and other, uh, let's say call them bacteria infused uh, probiotic yogurt, right? But right now the market for, if you told people I'm put extra viruses in your yogurt, I don't think I'd have a good market share. Maybe that will change with time. And I don't have that slide here today where I've created my fake campaign, but you're raising an important point and maybe with time, that's in fact what we'll be doing, but I think we still have a ways to go. Okay, thank you. Yes. Great, any other question? Um, hi, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna start the video. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the nice lecture. Uh, my question was about always diversity. I think in part you replied before, like, um, of course, you were talking about like an acute um, phase of the illness, so not a big uh, specific diversity of the of the microorganism to be uh, killed by phages or by the immune system. But what about like the the, the intraspecific diversity that might be uh, caused by the like the evolution of of the microorganism of its own uh, dif different and differential like um, uh, sorry, uh, defense against phages? Like, can that be modeled? And... Yeah, so in some of my earliest work in this space, and thank you for the question, one of the first problems I worked on also with Simon Levin is co-evolutionary dynamics arising from precisely the mechanism that you describe in which phage in some sense catalyzed diversity, which then leads to catalysts of more phage and so on. And we've worked in other cases showing that you can have co-evolutionary dynamics and diversification stimulated by these interactions. In the context of therapy, that's, I mean, that's fascinating from a fundamental sense, but they may not be the right outcome you want from a therapeutic sense. As you can see here already, even if there was a pre-existing phage resistant mutant, right? In the event that there was this immune response that got eliminated. So in some sense, selection operated because of your addition of phage, and led to a proliferation, but it could be controlled. However, in a broader sense, there's also something that we've been working on and I'll see if I can, while speaking, find it for you, but there's a new paper on bioarchive by Justin Meyer's group talking about co-evolutionary phage training. And I will, it's something that I, we've been thinking about from a theoretical perspective. I don't know if I can write to everyone in the chat uh, at once, maybe I'll send it to Jacobo and he can write to everyone in the chat uh, with it. But basically the idea is that it may be possible to look forward in time, yeah. finding what kinds of phage might arise because of the emergence of new mutants, but then go back and apply those at the beginning to stop the emergence in a therapeutic sense. So I think we always have to keep in mind, I mean, these co-evolutionary systems are so cool and fascinating, we want to understand them, but in a therapeutic sense, they may not be our friend per se. So we have to think about maybe ways to leverage and that's one that we've been very interested in exploring. Great. Um, yes, this is a question that is, there is a question in the chat that is related to a question that was already asked and uh, Egar is wondering whether we can engineer phages so that it will facilitate a better recognition of the bacteria by the immune system. So the answer to that is we've been working on that for quite some time and in principle, uh, probably yes, in practice, which we're working on maybe harder and maybe others are also working in this space, but that's clearly one that, it, as you can see implied by my, the, the work here, where there may be reasons to think about phage, not just as agents of mortality, but also as synergistic elements potentially even adjuvants. And in that case, it does reshape the way that we might want to engineer phage, as was pointed out, in order to have better ecosystem effects, not just 
killing or lytic activity in the absence of that ecosystem. These are all, and I would just say, since we're almost at time, last time, just to thank you for everyone in the audience for these questions. Obviously, if people want to follow up, I'd be delighted. Uh, and also to point out that this field, I've tried to introduce topics in which the story isn't totally written yet. That story needs to be written by all of us. So I hope that maybe some of you might be interested in, in what's happening here and work in your own universities um, to try to advance these the, the sort of ecosystem and eco-evolutionary approaches to understanding viruses and their microbial hosts. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for this uh, very great uh, lectures. And uh, um, it was really great. Thank you very much for the uh, involvement in, uh, in this. And uh, well, thanks again to everyone for attending the school. We will uh, meet each other again tomorrow uh, at the usual time, I guess. Uh, yes, no, a little bit later than usual at 2 30 Italian time with the first lecture by Andrea Rinaldi. So thank you again, Joshua, and thank you everybody for being, for being here. Thanks. Thank you, Joshua. Thanks all, thanks again. Take care. Thank you, sir.